All right, let's continue on with Learning Objective 4 of Chapter 12 now. We're going to look at impairment, or determining the impairment, potential impairment, of limited life intangibles. So, in this case, what you're going to see um, as we go through this is a lot of similarity to what we saw as the impairment testing um, in, pre in the previous chapters on uh, tangible assets. So, impairment of limited life um, intangibles, again, those that have a uh, potential useful life, a retirement life. So same as impairment for PPE in previous chapters, we're going to conduct a recoverability test. And we're also going to conduct a fair value test. Okay. And we're going to still, if there is an impairment, we'll still record it as other expenses and losses of incidental loss if there is, in fact, an impairment. So, next page, let's look at an example where Birbo has a patent. And the patent is based on a process and how to extract oil from shale. And as part of its annual impairment, it finds that the expected future cash flows from this patent are $35 million. So Birbo's patent has a carrying value currently of $60 million. What does that mean? So here I've sort of brought in the sheet that you've used before in the previous chapter that looks at impairment. So we don't really know the care, we don't know the cost or accumulated whatever. All we know is that there is a carrying amount of the patent that is $60 million. So $60 million is a carrying value. It doesn't really matter beyond that. Okay. $35 million is the expected future cash flows. So similar to what you've seen before, we compare the expected future cash flows against the netbook value or the carrying value of the asset. Now, if we expect to generate 35 million in future cash, is the current value, the current netbook value of the asset too high? In this case it is. We're showing that we've got this $60 million worth of future economic benefit when in reality, we're only going to get $35 million in future economic benefit. Uh-oh, what does that mean? It means that the net book value is bigger, therefore we have an impairment. So step two says, what do we write it down to? And that's where we look at the fair value. Fair value of the patent is $20 million. So come down here, $20 million is a fair value. And that must be what we show as the net book value or new carrying value of the patent. So what does that mean? We got to write the sucker down by $40 million. Now, one thing to be careful about here, when it comes to expected future cash flows versus fair value, those are two different things, okay? The reason why we look at future cash flow for assets, even tangible assets, we look at future cash flow. And the reason why is because those assets are meant to be help us specifically generate future cash in our specific business. So these assets have a future cash flow that's very idiosyncratic, very specific to what we need. Once we figure out what the future cash flows are, the question is, well, what would this asset go for if we decided to sell it? And that's where fair value comes in. Fair value is much more objective. Okay. So down below, we're going to record a debit loss on impairment. That's on the income statement. Yikes. $40 million. And we'll go ahead and credit the patent directly. We don't need to use accumulated amortization. If we do use accumulated amortization, we would credit accumulated amortization. Here I'm simply saying is most companies just write down intangible assets directly. So $40 million. Okay. Very, very similar to what we saw when we looked at impairment testing on tangible fixed assets. So now let's look at a situation where we have a potential impairment of an indefinite life, indefinite life intangible asset. And goodwill is the big one we usually look at. So as I said before, goodwill must be tested for impairment at least annually. At least once every year. That's the longest it ever really goes. Does it get tested on a quarterly basis? Now they may do a few analytics, but never really test it. Annual test is really where they do that. 
the impairment rule for goodwill is a fair value or quantitative test. We're really going to look at this not from a future cash flow perspective. We're just going to look at this purely from a fair value. So there's no real worry about future cash flows for this asset goodwill. And we'll talk a little bit more about that next. One of the reasons why we don't worry about future cash flow is because it's very difficult to determine what future cash flows goodwill generates because it's an indefinite life asset. And we can't you know, project into infinity necessarily, not at least easily. So the idea here is that the company compares a fair value of, a, of the reporting unit. Yes, it's goodwill. That is a specific asset. But the goodwill arose because why? Because we purchased another company. Once the company, once that target company is incorporated, generally speaking, it becomes within the parent one of the many operating units. So this could be, say for instance, Midder Light, and this could be Dud Miser, right? We have different divisions producing different products. They're diff called different reporting units. A reporting unit, division, product line, same idea here. We purchase a company, it resulted in goodwill. Now that company no longer exists, except it's now a division or reporting unit within me, the bigger company. If the fair value exceeds the carrying amount of the goodwill, then we can say it's not impaired. In other words, if the fair value of the reporting unit exceeds whatever the goodwill is, we're going to look at an example here, but we're going to say it's not impaired. So this is really a concern where we say, if the reporting unit, say for instance, there's something, uh, I don't know, maybe like there's a contaminant in one of our product lines, or perhaps people's tastes and preferences have changed, right? They're no longer buying certain types of Beanie Babies or whatever we sell, right? That's where we really have to worry about, hey, maybe this product line is gone. Maybe we need to delete it. Maybe it needs to go away. Usually... A reporting unit is on the chopping block if it by itself is generating operating losses. We can produce individual income statements and balance sheets for all these reporting units. If we do that, we can monitor and see whether or not these reporting units are still generating a profit. If they're not generating a profit, let's get rid of them. That's one of the reasons why we potentially have to write down the goodwill that we initially recorded because we bought that company. So in this example here, and we'll call this illustration 1A. Okay. Beerbo acquired Coronavirus Inc. several years ago, which resulted in 900000 of goodwill. Beerbo continues to sell Coronavirus products and closely monitors the operating profits and losses from CBD. Beerbo is reviewing CBD to determine if the $900,000 goodwill has been impaired. The following is a list of, of CBD's net assets. So we'll run a report, a, a query in our accounting system to say, show me the cash of this division, CBD. Show me accounts receivable related to CBD. Show me inventory related to CBD. We might like consolidate all these when we report, but on an individual unit basis, we have individual financial statements for these units to see, hey, whether or not they are still operating at a profit and what the assets are in place for those particular units. In this case, if we run a query for CBD, we find that net assets, the net assets of the unit, i.e. the net book value of CBD, coronavirus division, is 2400000 that is the book value of the division, assets minus liabilities on a book value basis. Now, continue further with 1A. What if, let's assume that the fair value of that division is 2,800,000. Perform the, perform the impairment test. So we're going to look not at future cash flows. We're going to look at straight up, just keep it simple. What's the fair value of this division? And one of the reasons why we look at that is because potentially we have a product line that we that doesn't maybe doesn't provide any profit, or maybe we just want to sell it to somebody and say, hey, you go ahead and produce this stuff. We don't want to do it anymore. It's no longer part of our quote unquote strategic vision. So if we look at the fair value of this division, maybe we find out that, hey, 
it's the va fair value is 2800. We could sell it to maybe a competitor or whatever, get, just get rid of it if we don't want to sell those products or have that division anymore. And now we're going to compare that to what the current book value is or carrying value is of that division. Now, this is kind of unique because we're not really looking at a specific asset. We're looking at essentially a subsidiary or division on a whole basis within the company. Okay. So we're looking at all the assets and liabilities committed to just producing C C coronavirus products. And we're going to compare that division as a whole to what its fair value is, not just the, not just the goodwill. Okay? In this case, the, we can see that the fair value of CBD is bigger. Which means, hey, no impairment. Now, granted, we see that the difference here is only about four hundred thousand. The fair value of the division is only about four hundred thousand dollars above the book value. That's not the value of the goodwill initially recorded, but that's okay. It's a straight up just a comparison between the fair value of the unit or the subsidiary overall against its net book value or net assets. So long as the fair value of the division is greater than the book value of the division, no impairment, we can move on. Okay, a little bit of an easy threshold. In the past, this used to be a lot more complicated, my dear. Now, on the next page, let's say same situation, but this is now... What do we call this? Illustration 1B. Now assume that the fair value of CBD is 1,900,000. Okay? So, same thing as we do before. Plug in the fair value, 1,900. Right? Now, which one is bigger? Well, the net book value is clearly bigger than the fair value of the company, which suggests, hey, maybe people aren't buying this, the coronavirus products anymore. Wonder why? I don't know. But it means potentially also that, at the very least, that goodwill within this $2.4 million is goodwill of 900000 that needs to be written down. How much do we write down goodwill? Well, same process as we've done before. We're going to take this fair value, bring it over on the right-hand side as well, a little bit easier this time. 1.9 million is what essentially is the value of the reporting unit, in which case we need a $500,000 reduction. Where do we reduce the value of a reporting unit as a whole? We reduce it by its good reduce the goodwill portion of that of the division's net assets so in this case goodwill is currently a debit balance in this 2.4 there's a debit balance of 900,000 is good of goodwill we need to reduce that with a credit we're going to credit goodwill in the CBD division the coronavirus division we're going to reduce that by 500,000 that will bring down the overall division's net assets to $1.9 million. What are we going to debit? And just do a debit loss on impairment. The point of the matter is this. As it stands before this journal entry, the overall assets of this division are too high relative to what the market says they're worth. So we're going to say, look, if we had to reduce the value of a division... Where do we start? Start right in with goodwill. Goodwill goes to zero at that point. The real question is, what are the assets that are really losing value? Because if we have to sell this thing off, maybe we just maybe that's the time when we just find a buyer and get rid of the CB division. And that's how you, that's all you have to worry about for impairment testing for chapter twelve. Now keep in mind the unique part about. Um, the impairment testing of goodwill. It's an indefinite life asset. 
So we do not worry about, don't worry about, do not worry about future cash flows related to goodwill testing. We don't have to do that stuff. And the reason why is because it's very difficult for us to project the future cash flows of an entire division. It's easier for us to project the future cash flows of a specific asset within the division, but not the division as a whole. So the FASB says, look, just look, just focus on the fair value of the division as a whole. Don't worry about future cash flows. So it makes it a little bit easier for us when we do all of our accounting.